So, we've discussed your director's myopic intentions as well as his cunning and relentless techniques. Let's now turn our attention to his three primary motivations, his three C's. Now, although they are valuable mental impulses under the right circumstances, with enough unconscious use in internalization, they will end up unwittingly directing your entire life. Coleridge's three C's are certainty, comparison, and comfort. Let's go in alphabetical order and start with certainty because I recently read in a scientific journal that it helps with comprehension and retention. Okay, I just made that up. But to make a point, I mean, don't we all just love to believe that there's a method and reason for everything? And if we can simply discover and understand those reasons, We'll know precisely how to live, what to say and do to get ahead, to appear confident, to improve our Q scores, and to remain problem-free and in complete control. That's Coleridge, your storytelling mind. It hungers for a sense of control and safety, and feeling certain is what soothes that craving. I mean, let me ask you something. Why do new fitness, weight loss, and relationship books and articles continue to flood the market? I mean, is it because the information in the previous ones was misguided or needs to be updated? I mean, why do we obsessively click and swipe our smartphones to check the comments and reviews on our creations? Do we think it will somehow change what we've done or who we are? And why on earth do people compulsively watch weather reports and then discuss it with their friends? I'll tell you why. Because we have an almost violent desire to know things. We view life as something we simply must figure out, especially since we don't feel safe enough, good enough, or prepared enough to relax and enjoy it. I mean, we don't feel good enough in our own skins. We don't feel confident enough in our work. And my God, what if we're not prepared for the impending storm? We might not have enough milk, bread, and batteries. But once you have the information, once you know what you should believe in and what you should do, you can finally kick back and relax, right? And that's the ultimate benefit of certainty. It's consoling. It allows you to go back on autopilot in your comforting movie with your hypnotized supporting cast of characters, confident that everything will turn out just fine. At least, that's what you believe. And belief is what provides relief. Look, have you ever relaxed in certainty regarding some aspect of your life and then later discovered that someone lied to you, making it all a distressing illusion? When the rug has been pulled out from under you like that, when you experience this groundlessness and sudden powerlessness, it can feel devastating. And that's because you've temporarily lost control of your script. You're floating in uncertainty and the world suddenly stops making sense to you. You don't know where you're heading or who or what to hold on to. On the other hand, if you believe you know what's going on, what's happening around you, especially the near-term future and general direction, you feel safe. That's why you resist change and want your agendas and ideologies to prevail. It gives you the comforting feeling of knowing how things will turn out, assuring you that your script is solid, that you have the knowledge and experience to survive. 
I mean, it's really strange. We cling desperately to control, to a delusional certainty about life, while at the same time, we deny the actual certainty, which is, it's a temporary trip. And you and everyone around you are going to die. And sooner than you imagine. And that's the trouble. For as Buddha made clear, you think you have time. You don't. I mean, a friend of mine recently experienced the devastating mental storm that comes with the perceived loss of control over one's narrative. After decades of devoted marriage, of living as the husband and father character in a traditional story, doing, again, what he believed were the right things to do, his wife unexpectedly ended it. And instead of seeing that event as a combination of dynamic and uncontrollable forces, his mind suffered with the uncertainty of the abrupt ending. His identity as the central character of that story was threatened, stripped away, really. I mean, he felt lost. It forced him to go inside and to understand what had happened, to make some kind of meaning out of it. I mean, were his values and assumptions about married life misguided? Had he made poor decisions? Uh, was there something wrong with him? How had he lost control of that situation, of that role? Would his future render a similar fate? You see, he finally realized that he never had control. None of us do. Control over life is an illusion. Most of what happens has little to do with your conscious decisions. Instead, you're involved in an interdependent relationship, a dance with energy, with other people, nature, the evolving, dynamic, and chaotic world. You do not exist independently, but you imagine that you do. You create a meaning-infused story with you as the central character, and then you rationalize that you are a, an autonomous, powerful individual, free to be yourself and entitled to have your script play out just as you imagined. And by the way, with no damn interruptions or distractions. Uncertainty is the ultimate distraction, and Coleridge hates it. He rebels against anything that will interrupt or disturb the business and busyness of the performance. And so he stirs you up and compels you to understand and explain everything to yourself, and as quickly as possible especially the actions of others. And when no explanation is forthcoming, he'll help you make one up to suit your hero script and keep the plot moving. You see, Coleridge is not after the truth. And he's pretty much indifferent to others and to learning through ex exploration and discovery. He just wants answers and he wants them now. Think back to when you were a kid, asking, why, why, why? Endless questions all day long, continuous, because you were surprised by what was happening around you and you wanted to know what would happen in the future. You weren't really after the truth, not really. You just wanted to end the distress of the unknown. Your beliefs were and still are driven by your self-concerned story your personal script, your desires, your goals, your identity. Everyone's are, and that's our problem. In the early 1600s, when Galileo's surprising observations confirmed Copernicus's theory that the sun was at the center of our solar system and not the earth, was everyone happy, thankful for the breakthrough information? Hardly. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church called it foolish, absurd, and heretical since it explicitly contradicted Holy Scripture. Galileo's discovery threatened the church's story, and so they locked him up in his house for the final nine years of his life. When Dr. Semmelweis 
a prickly obstetrician, demonstrated in the 1800s that hand washing by caregivers could drastically reduce the number of women dying after childbirth. Was his discovery enthusiastically received? Hell no, because he couldn't provide a conclusive scientific explanation for his germ theory of disease. Plus, the German doctors were offended at the suggestion that they should wash their hands. Who was this Hungarian Jew to question our hero stories? Look, many visionary scientists, philosophers, and entrepreneurs have had their ideas ridiculed and rejected because they didn't fit the script of the prevailing culture. And Coleridge used this notion of certainty as a potent weapon to hold them down and preserve the status quo. Prove to me beyond all reasonable doubt that you are special and that it works the way you say it does. Prove through a detailed analysis that you will not threaten our story. Guess what? He's doing the exact same thing to you, to your perceptions and intuitions, all the time, and below your own level of conscious awareness. Feelings and thoughts simply arise during your scripted performance, and you mindlessly follow them. After all, you know your script by heart, and you're confident that your assumptions about the world and about others are correct. So why pause to even consider them? Have you ever ridden a crowded subway? You're in a hurry, rushing to catch the next train, and you come to two turnstiles. One has a long line of people waiting to get through, and the one next to it is completely free. You assume, like everyone else, that the empty turnstile is broken. Well, that's how you live your life. You assume that everyone knows what they're doing and that everything you see and hear is more or less accurate. Yeah, you probably believe that um, quicksand will suck you underground until you die, right? Poinsettias, or poinsettias, are highly toxic to cats, aren't they? And brown eggs are better for you than white eggs. None of those beliefs are true. But who cares, right? Better safe than sorry. Plus, who has time for such unimportant considerations? You've got a hero story to act out. Do you see? The same is true with anything uncertain and unfamiliar in life. Why question something that everyone around you is doing or which they assure you is true and righteous? Why associate with someone different than you in looks, I don't know, status or beliefs? What's it going to accomplish? You already know what's going on, so you think. So why waste the time and energy? Why even subject yourself to the unpredictable dynamics of human interaction, if you don't have to, right? I mean, for example, do you know that more teens today would rather text their friends than hang out in real life? Why? Because it makes things more certain. It gives them a sense of control. When you live in a script of certainty, driven by your past experiences, you have no idea what you are actually missing in life. Because you only see what you want to see and nothing more. What you chose to reject because it didn't fit your script may have been something that set you off in a new direction and changed your life forever. I want you to do me a favor. Sit quietly when you get a chance and read Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. And I want you to really think about what he's trying to get across. It's not a salute to nonconformity. He's not telling you to be different than others, 
to take an unwalked path. Read it closely and you'll discover that both paths had been worn the same. And so the two roads were pretty much the same. What Frost is saying with tongue pressed firmly in cheek, I took the one less traveled, is that it's all a crapshoot. There is no way to be certain about any of your life choices. So the important question is, why not take the path that speaks uniquely to you? Why not do and say what your heart is telling you in the moment? I'll tell you why. For the same reason that everyone misinterprets Frost's poem. Because you believe that life is about comparison. Figuring things out and making the best choices. You don't see that any path can bring meaning excitement, and fulfillment once you step out of your story and stop obsessing over the past. But you will.